So thanks for coming out on a Valentine's Day. I guess you couldn't get a reservation to the Sizzler or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> um, so we took a trip to the Nordic countries in 2019, June of 2019. And we planned it for a long time, and it was one of the best trips that we ever took. Um, so, I have a lot of photos here to share. Some are birds. <laughs> um, well, let me back up a second. Well, here we are. So, uh, finding feathered, finned, and furry friends in Scandinavia. A grand trip to Norway and Svalbard. A lot of people have never heard where Svalbard is. Um, oh, you have the laser, okay. So will have the laser. So Svalbard is an archipelago of, it's part of Norway, but it's an island chain um, very far north. Uh, basically, it is about as far north as you can get and still have year-round ice-free. Because of, the, because of the way the, uh, the ocean currents come up here, or warm up around Iceland and then up through here and circulate, you, you have warmer waters and then the western so side of Svalbard remains ice-free. Now this side freezes up and then pretty much north of that up to the pole here is, um, is pack ice year-round. Um, so now there are ice, it's ice in the water, but it's navigable. We were there actually on the summer solstice. So it was 24 hour daylight and it was warm, actually quite warm. Um, but year round people can go there and it's, it's about as far north as you can get without being in the military. By warm it was like 50. Yeah. So it wasn't, you know, there are excursions to the North Pole for wealthy people uh, that leave out of Murmansk. There's an icebreaker that goes up and back. Uh, but pretty much unless you take that, you're not going to get closer to the North Pole than this. And there's some really great wildlife to see there. So it was a bucket list destination and it was a great trip. So uh, it is 650 miles to the North Pole. So here's a little bit about the trip. It took us seven flights to get there. And here you can see, we went to Copenhagen, and then we, we drove around and then we flew up to Svalbard back and back, back. But if you, if you look at the, the line there, uh, using the Mercator projection over here in um, Alaska, you know, straight across, it's, it's way up there. So uh, we drove 3,283 miles in those countries there. So, uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, a lot of our journey was south of the Arctic Circle, but this is where the good stuff was. Almost all of our wildlife sighting was up in the up in the Arctic region, especially this this peninsula over here, and then Svalbard, and, that, and that's towards the end of the presentation. That was that was at the end. So, why do people even go to Norway? Well, a lot of people go there because they like to see fjords and. That's a great reason to go when we saw a number of them and drove around them and, and uh, took, went out on boats on, you know. Um, there's a gazillion waterfalls uh, to see. And here's a few that we took photos of. Um, some people go for the architecture. Uh, churches and so forth and that's really a good if you've never been to Europe I mean the, the architecture is fascinating this church up here the Nidaros Cathedral is the northernmost Catholic Church in Europe the one on the right is the oldest building left in Bergen built in about 1130 to 1180 a couple of these other small churches the Daros was actually started in I think 1070 and took like 300 years to complete. 
And then you got some more weird architectures, some more modern stuff. This was the, the curly Q one was next to our hotel, and we thought it was interesting. Um, but what you really want to see if you're looking for churches in Norway is this. These are called stave churches. Um, I didn't have my notes. There were about a th think about a thousand of them, maybe seven hundred of them built, and there are twenty eight left. They're built of wood. This black is actually pitch, like tar, that they put over it to preserve it, and they have to recoat it like every two years. And I mean, it's tacky to touch. It it looks well. It's baked on, and then they reapply and reapply. It's it's weird, but it's a preservation. They're very small inside, but um, uh, it's considered Norway's greatest contribution to architecture. And they're fascinating to see. Some people go for the culture. This is downtown in Bergen, very scenic. We've got some bands going. Uh, Viking reenacting that a castle. This is, uh, this is in Trondheim over here, this lower right one. Uh, just picture walking across the bridge, hiking around. Just very scenic, uh, cultural stuff. Some people just go for the landscape. These are just some various photos that I really liked on the tour. We did a lot of driving, so a lot of pictures from the road. I love road trips. Both of us do. Here's a famous mountain road. It's considered one of the top 10, top 20, depending on who you ask, driving roads. Uh, I drove down it, Christy drove back up it, and then we drove back down. I flew my drone around it, and it's... Uh, no car versus bus accidents. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's 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 very popular. It was a gorgeous day. Um, I got video and, and posted it to my YouTube channel. It's, yeah, it was fascinating. But there's two waterfalls, um, eleven hairpin curves, 20, 2,300 feet of elevation. If you can't read that, uh, there are buses. The the limit is forty one feet long. So the 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 hairpins are pretty wide. And there are paces to pass people. Some of it's one lane. It's, it's, it's a fascinating drive. Tunnels. We drove through 200, we went through 258 tunnels in Norway. 68 in trains, 190 on the road, and 10 of them were underwater, including this one that has an eye. It looks like a monster there. So that tunnel up there, it's called the Lairdal Tunnel. It's the world's longest road tunnel. It's 15, over 15 miles long, and they built three little caverns inside of it. And that little blue thing, you can stop, get out, walk around about it about every five miles in, 15 miles. And there's curves in there. It's, it's fascinating. But yeah, tunnels all over the place. Trains, ferries, boats, motorcycles, different modes of transportation. We took eight ferries, and that's our little rental car. We called him Marco. He was a VW Polo. That's why we called him Marco. Some people go for the flowers. The flowers there were pretty small. We found them. They're, they're quite small there in the north. And we even found them put on our food. They would sprinkle flowers as a... I, I can't call it a garnish because it was actually right on top. So it was, a spice or a flavoring, I don't know. We thought it was kind of odd, but yeah. Food. Different entrees there, and of course, can't get without your seafood. Fish and chips, but that's what the fish looks like before it gets on your plate. Uh, don't know exactly what that guy in the middle is. Who's <laughs> fish? Is it? Uh, and then they serve whale down there. It's one of the few countries that uh, still hunts whale. Activities. That beach is in the... Uh, uh, that's on the Arctic Ocean. It's, north, it's, it's in, above the Arctic Circle. These people are skiing over here. Um, in shorts, 
uh, summertime practicing their cross country skiing, and we saw that in Svalbard where they had their mush and their dogs to get around town. Christy doing some hiking near a fjord up in the hills. It's pretty late at night. It was almost probably 11 o'clock at night. And of course, some people actually go there to look at the wildlife, which is probably what you guys are more interested in than those other things. So, we did see some wildlife. South of the Arctic Circle, we didn't see much wildlife. Of course, we weren't really looking for it. We didn't go specifically birding in the south. We started in Bergen and we drove our way through the fjords and up. So we saw some common stuff. The hooded crow was interesting. I had never seen one of those before. Um, was either of these other birds new for back no, to, I don't know. We've seen hooded crow before. We saw them in Ireland. Ireland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. So. I'm the junior birder. So after all of our driving, uh, not all of it, half of it, um, we left the south and we, we headed north across the Arctic Circle. And that's the first time for me to drive across the Arctic Circle. So there we are, still in shorts. It was the last day for shorts. Um, at the Arctic Circle, a uh, little pillar there, a roadside rest, souvenir stand. Uh, and then we drove up to this town called Bodo, which we took a ferry to go out on some islands. And uh, that up there is the ferry coming in the night before we left. We're gonna take that ferry the next day. That's 2 a.m. So that's the sun setting at 2 a.m. Uh, we, we heard that this was a good place to see white-tailed eagles. So it was 2 a.m. I had just driven 450 miles. I was tired. Christy's like, we need to go out and look for these white-tailed eagles. So we went out and looked, and we found a gray heron and a Eurasian oyster catcher, and then we went back to the room. <laughs> so fear, fear not. Fear not. We, we, will, we will see some later. So... So the next day we got onto the longest ferry, several hours across, to the Lofoten Islands. And I can read it, but you might not be able to. So we started in Bergen, here, here, that church is in Trondheim, and then 450 miles between Trondheim to here. It was just in one, in one. We thought about flying, like we're just gonna drive it. And then we went out to these Lofoten Islands. Unbelievable, gorgeous scenery. We were there two nights. We could have spent weeks there. There is some good birding, not the best that we saw. Uh, there's a lot of scenery. The weather was gorgeous. I flew my drone around a little bit. Just everywhere you looked, it was, it was great. It's also a great place for whale watching. Oh, we okay. had a, an excursion booked. Um, Too much wind, and, right? Yeah, it, that got wind. canceled. I forgot about that, but yeah. Supposedly some of the best wheel watch that we could have hoped for it would have been up there. In the shoulder season and the winter time, I mean, this is a great destination for uh, northern lights. Of course, you know, with all the sunlight, uh, they could have been up there, but we didn't see any. <laughs> uh, but I've seen pictures over those mountains right there near that fishing village. I particularly love this one spot there. Uh, but just like everywhere you went, quaint little fishing villages. That's where we saw some, that took some of those pictures of the fish. And, and that's, that's one of the main industries up there is fish. I think it's cod. Salted cod. So we did do some birding up here and we stopped. And a lot of times we would along the road, she would say, okay, stop. And we, we would find these little inlets into the, to the ocean there. Um, and just look around the periphery and we found a lot of stuff. Uh, just near the roads, we would stop and take some photos and maybe get out and look around and then move on and, you know, go another two miles and then, well, here's another one. This looks like a good candidate or whatever. So, whooper swan, common eiders, black-throated loon, also called arctic loon. We found uh, this young Eurasian oyster catcher with his mom. Mom's teaching him how to clam here. He's got some self some yums down there, so it was fun, fun to watch them. Common red shank, really long legs. Field fair, I had never heard of that. Was that a new species for us? Mm -hmm. Tufted duck. 
Great lag goose. Domesticated sheep along the road. Okay, so we only spent two days in the Lofoten Islands, but we also crossed above the Arctic Circle through Sweden up into Finland and then back to Norway. We spent one night in Sweden. Um, saw reindeer and mountain hare. That's about the only animals we saw. And when we see reindeer, these aren't like our caribou that we see in Alaska that are wild. These are, herded. these are domesticated reindeer that the folks in this area herd for food to sell for the rest of the country. Caribou or reindeer it's big is a very in, in common area. food to eat up there. It's fantastic. So we had heard of this place called the Ice Hotel, and there's actually several of them around the world, but this is, I think, the second one they made. Uh, so we said, hey, let's stop there. We wanted to check out the Ice Hotel. We didn't, we, st we stayed at the hotel, but we didn't stay in one of the ice rooms. It's refrigerated underneath this mound of dirt here. Um, it's uncomfortable, and for a number of reasons, we decided not to stay in, and we slept in a above a above freezing room but we did get a tour around and we stopped at the ice bar and we got a little drink out of an ice cube so that was interesting um but uh there's like 20 different rooms and each room has a different artist who carves it so it was, it was a fascinating visit couldn't keep the shot glass as a souvenir though <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't make the trip huh so then i got to thinking like two days later i was like hmm I hope they don't recycle. <laughs> so the next morning we woke up and kept driving. Uh, we went up through Finland. And actually, I think we drove more through Finland than Sweden. So I'll tuck the duck along the road. It was mostly a driving day. We went up to a lake called Lake Inari up in a region that the people up there are called Sami, Sami. And historically they've done uh, herding of... Reindeer uh, husbandry. Yeah, right, reindeer. And that's that's a big part of the life. I just thought, thought that sign was funny. I try to pronounce those words, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So the border crossing was, was very unassuming. It's just, oh, in the middle of the road, here's the sign. Oh yeah, by the way, you're in Finland now. <clears throat> I didn't even think there was a camera there. Sweden had cameras, but it was like crossing the state line. So that's a traffic jam in Finland along the back roads. 50, 100 uh, sheep, not sheep, reindeer, uh, Some of them domesticated. Some with bells. Yep. A number of calves. Marked with ear tags and also bells. They made funny sounds. Can you do the sound? Yep. 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 But they'll, uh, they'll funny. spray paint them with different colors on different areas of the body so they can keep everybody's farms kind of separated when they go to herd them up. They know, you know, if blue on the right hip is Sam's and, you know, red on the front shoulder is Pete's. If you've never tried caribou or reindeer, it's delicious. If you go to Alaska, you can get like reindeer sausage for breakfast or whatever. It, it's really good. At, at our hotel at Lake Inari, um, we got our, uh, at the, there wasn't a lot of people there. Um, but we got like a table right next to the lake and we, I got sauteed reindeer, uh, finished on whatever that is, you know, and she got you know, reindeer steak, I think it was, yeah. uh, delicious. So, okay. And we stopped at a museum for the Sami culture and then we moved on. We were up along, you know, there's my GPS there. We, were, we skirted right up along the Norway border. And by border, I mean that obelisk is in Russia. This obelisk is in Norway, and there's a little stream along there. So, you know, this little black line. We wanted to go up to the northern tip. There's, they said there was some, some wildlife up here. There's a little church. It's kind of just an interesting thing to, to do. Uh, we didn't know what we would see. It was actually busier than I thought. I thought it would be like no one out there. There's the old church. 
Uh, we did see some bursts, but it was it was very windy. Um, great cormorant. It's a great cormorant, but it's a lousy photo. Mm -hmm. Common snipe, really long beak. And a wheat ear. We also saw a stoat, just like a weasel. Did not get a photo of it, but it was scurrying around when we were trying to get up into that church. Church was locked, you couldn't see inside, but um, you could walk around it. Um, it would have been nice to get a photo of a stoat. It was, it was something I don't think you see that often. So, um, I think one of the, no, the best birding we saw on the entire trip was this thing called the Varanger Peninsula. And that is this peninsula up here. And we had heard that at, out at the end of the peninsula there would be an island that had some good birding, but we didn't know what we were really in, in for. Um, and it's a, a wind swept landscape, a long drive out. There's only like one or two towns on the way out. At the end, there's this town called Vardo. And we were heading towards the island of Horton the way up. That was our destination. Along the way, we happened to see our white-tailed eagle. We saw a number of them. So in flight, it's like, I think that's an eagle. I think that must be one of the white-tailed. And then we saw a number of them along the side of the road, uh, down by the beach or kind of like a cliff area on the side of the hill. And later on in a museum, uh, there was one hanging there. And I was like, OK, let's see how big it is. I don't remember. Did you look it up? I did not. OK. I don't know if it's bigger than a bald or a golden. It's comparable. It's, it's, it's big, though. So. so we were happy to find that. We did see a couple more later. And there's a, a better picture of a white-tailed eagle. Some nice whooper swans in flight. So here we're heading out. That bird, you can't read it, but the name of that ship is Hornoya. And that's the little town uh, that we got into about 2 a.m. at the end of the night. Long drives between towns. Um, and we booked a tour to, by tour I mean boat transportation to the island. It's not a tour. Uh, and we stayed at this horrible hotel that catered to birders that... Uh, it's pretty much just a hostel. It's a hostel. It, it had running water and it had a bed, so we're good. It's right next to the, it's right next to the boat dock. <laughs> Convenient. So there were a couple of birds there. And it was noisy. You could hear it and smell it before you saw it. So this is what, it's a little hard for, for us to see here on the presentation, but you know, when we got there, these cliffs uh, and the boat stops and you just, okay, so you're just, the sound is just deafening of all these birds and then you get up closer. And there's hundreds of thousands. And there's a list that, you know, I, the species to check out. And we just, we were just taking photos, looking for different stuff. Uh, I believe they said there's usually between 130 and 200,000 breeding pairs on that island of multiple birds every season. This is the easternmost tip of Norway. Actually farther east than where I was by the Russian border because it's it's a peninsula up higher. And it, it's kind of weird because the way, you know, the curvature of the earth and you know it's it's far north it's almost as far east as moscow so i mean norway is actually wide because it's close closer to the pole um but uh that's just an aside but yeah we saw oh there i'm hanging out uh in the the shag shack <laughs> uh, there's about a dozen shags nesting in and around and up on these little steps Underneath. Poop everywhere. It's it's drizzling and it's cold and I'm not really into hiking around. There's plenty of birds for me to see from there. So Christy went out walking a little bit. There's there's some trails, but a lot, the, the nesting closed down some of the trails to get up to the top. 
the, the season, it, it, it wasn't open for us. So all around me, surrounding me, were European shags. And a couple of them had some interesting behavior that we saw. This guy right here had this stick in his mouth. It was like a hollow piece, like a piece of bamboo kind of kind of wood. And you tell what he was doing. He was yeah, so he flew in with this stick. And he would take it and he would just tap it like that and it just made his nest. And then stop. And then tap it again. And then stop. And then he'd put it right next to the nest. Mate would and look at it, pick it up, take it into the nest, put it down, tap it again, put it down, and they'd have this little exchange where they kept taking it up and tapping it, and then eventually she took it and he left. So, and I mean, this was like this was like three or four feet for me because I'm standing, behavior. and like underneath the planks of where I'm standing, it was one of the nests, and I think his mate was right underneath it. So over on the bench I was sitting on, there was a shag there sort of tucking its eggs under and like, I think rolling them yep. um, right next to me. And then back in the thing, there was just um, uh, different levels. I'm thinking of the term plateau, plateaus, um, yes. terraces. Terraces, and each, each one had Met several. People, not birds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so Christy went up there. There's so there's the shack. There's the birds. Uh, there's a there's a solitary outhouse somewhere around here, and just walk around uh, looking for different species. <clears throat> Saw some Atlantic puffins. Got some good photos. Quite a few of them. They weren't the majority of the birds, but I mean, they were easy to pick out because they're a lot different. More puffins. Lots of razor bills. Some more good photos of razor bills. This is the thing that we saw um, the most of. Now, we saw common guillemots but some of them had the sunglasses uh, bridled. We had, I don't know what that was, bridled. Um, and I thought it was a different species, but it's the same, it's just a different variety. But we were looking for this other type of guillemot, and you really had to look through your photos to see the difference. It's called a Brunick guillemot. And it, they were just in, in and amongst, there's pairs of them here, and I circled them. So, they have this white along the side of their bills. You see it here, there are the beaks. Um, and they look like they have a little bit more like a penguin tuxedo that's cleaner, whereas the other ones, a regular guillemot is a little bit more streaky. What's the term? I did. I, I did, at the time. I I didn't wasn't looking for them. Um, I did, we knew they were there because it was on the the chart. But um, you know, but there was just thousands, and yeah. tens of thousands. We just were going like, through our photos. I think we took about ten thousand photos. It's kind of overwhelming. There was just so um, many on the trip. Yeah, great black back gall. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same ones that we have around here. Yep. Well, I meant the same exact guy. Yeah, no, but I've this guy that did he one. travel? Yeah, right. Harold. <laughs> Harold. <laughs> Commoniters. A raven there that was not very popular amongst the gulls. The kittiwakes. I think those were kittiwakes there. Yes. Uh, black leg kittiwake. You got. We saw this one with the mouth open. It's very red. Lips inside. Lots of kitty wakes. Arctic skua, that's called a parasitic Jaeger, I think, here. Some a number of them. A northern wheat ear. Oh, okay, so this is 
we left the island. We were only there a couple hours. Um, and we only went home with one souvenir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by souvenir, I don't really. I don't think I got the souvenir because I was under the cover. No, the souvenir got on my shoulder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been but to other bird cliffs, off. like Iceland has Where a lot of good bird cliffs, <laughs> and, and other places around the world, the country too. But this, I think I've seen more birds at this particular spot than any other. So that whole peninsula, if you ever get a chance to go to Norway and you're up in the north, there's not a whole lot going on there other than birds. <laughs> um, the scenery is int very interesting, but... Uh, very few towns, but yeah, very good birding spot. Would have been best to give it. If we had known more, we would have given more and explored further up the peninsula, up the north northern side along the. But um, it's a common thing when we're traveling. The Barents Sea, I think that is the Barents. We sea. always try to do too much because <laughs> we want yeah. to see everything. Everything. This yeah, was a three a three week trip. So. Uh, a long tailed skua down there, long tailed Jaeger. Meadow pipit and a northern weed ear. This is this is. Sorry, I have a question. Do you, I don't know if you're just a fan, but do you know what that plant, the orange, is like orange, red, and green behind the meadow? I don't, I don't know. No clue. It was about this high. Yeah, very mossy. The the no trees at this level. Oh, by the way, the the latitude of where we are up here. Is farther than the north, the northernmost tip in Alaska. So, like Barrow, Prudhoe Bay, this is farther north than that. And um, unfortunately, a lot of our birding was done by car at speed because he <laughs> well, there's was one on click, a mission click. because we had to get you know 250 miles was, are, is 250 miles away or whatever. And next, it's day, like, next day, next day, you've got 10 seconds. <laughs> When we retire, we hope to slow down a little bit and s smell these roses, right? Um, it was an ambitious trip, very ambitious. Uh, so this is back, we, we, uh, we went back to the town. We didn't stay the night, we went after the, after Hornoy, we went back and along the drive, like, okay, let's drive around a little bit. There's supposed to be some good birds in there. We found some, but an hour maybe spent looking around. Probably could have found more if we had more time. But Absolutely. Had to move sure. on. Yeah. So we were heading back towards the west because we were going to fly up to Svalbard. And along the way, we drove up to the northernmost tip of continental Europe, the northernmost road in Europe to this monument up here. What do they call it? Nordcap. Nordcap. And I go, you know, photo op. There's a there's a gift store, of course, and so forth. And there's actually a traffic jam. There's an accident in a tunnel. We were sitting there for about an hour and a half uh, along. Right along, this is the scenery near where we were sitting. Not exactly, but um, we saw some ships there. Um, and unfortunately, during the traffic jam, we weren't in a place where there was a lot of good birds. Unfortunately, or a bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so. Uh, but we were close to the front of the line, and behind us was bus. It's a tourist spot. Buses go up there. It's good. It's good paved road. Um, and we hurried up to get there because 400 of our closest friends were 10 minutes behind us. Mm -hmm. So we got in, got our photo before the mob came, and then we were leaving as all these people were coming in. So uh, I was passing people along the road. Like I would have get there first. Um, so anyway. We, uh, we hit the northernmost tip. It's pretty windy up there. On the way back to our hotel, uh, 2 a.m., we saw this, how many fox? Three of them? Three, three, three of them. No parents. Yeah, right, just the kids hanging around. And uh, on the trip, we saw seven total red fox, which was actually probably the most I've seen ever on a trip. At various locations, but three in this one spot. I think about the drive is going to a town called Hammerfest. Okay, stayed in Hammerfest, and then we zigzagged around. We went to a town called Trumsa, and that's where we flew up to Svalbard. So here's a map of Svalbard. 
and this big island's called Spitsbergen. Used to be called the whole place used to be called Spitsbergen. But so this is the main town. We took a tour. Of, our first tour we took up to this little town up here called Neallison. The next day we took a tour that went to Barentsburg and up to Pier Midden and then back. <clears throat> the only other settlement here is a little coal mining community that's not really for tourists, but it is very sparsely populated. Flying in over the glaciers, so we get there, and this is the sign at the airport. Now, it's pretty easy to get to, and there are regular flights, 7, 737s. It's not like it's a rinky-dink little place. Um, it is a rinky-dink little place. It just has <coughs> frequent flights, <laughs> daily flights, bigger usually. Points. Population is 2552. That's 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 rinky dink plus. <laughs> so world's northernmost settlement with a population over a thousand. And when you go up there, there's a lot of things you're gonna see this northernmost this or northernmost that. And um, and if it's not in this town, it's in one of the other little towns that we stopped that had the northernmost it. So <laughs> but it was fascinating. We actually were there on the summer solstice, so uh, we stayed there for three nights. It was the it was the longest stay we had of anywhere on the trip. And we stayed downtown <laughs> in Longyearbyen, and uh, it's so far north that if you want to see the northern lights, you have to look south. Wow. <laughs> the ring around the magnetic pole was actually oh. south of there. This is unusual. <laughs> Very people like what? Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> we didn't see them, but that's that's what they say. So. Uh, here's some pictures around town. So up on the left, people were out on their roof, bathing suits, just shirt off, or whatever, enjoying the sun, sunbathing. I mean, it was what 50 degrees, but sunny. Uh, this is the main drag. It's a pedestrian walkway down through the center of town. It was a happening place. I mean, at that time, just another it's picture. Also it's a colorful. Cruise ship terminal. Um, some of your adventure cruises, um, Tartarus and I think a few others will stop there in Long Urbion. When we were there, one of the big ships, it's actually controversial, they might stop doing it, but they have ships with up to 6,000 people, which is more than the town will stop by. And it, it's a bit of a strain that they, for them to deal with that many tourists at once. Um, that port was pretty active. So here's a, some outdoor dining with some uh, reindeer skins, and there's a parking sign for snowmobiles. There are more snowmobiles than people. Uh, very fascinating place. Here I am. Uh, wasn't sure about running a car, but we decided to. It's a terrible photo of me, but it's the northernmost car rental <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Uh, there's only 30 miles of roads to drive. But if uh, you want to see birds. If you want to see birds and get out of town, you can Uber it or get the taxi or whatever. There's a bus, there's a shuttle bus to get back and forth, and we thought we'd do that. But you it's like, walk. we wanted to get out and do on some of your roads. The but problem, polar bears. Mm. Polar bear safety. Mm. Uh, it's actually illegal to go outside the settlement without a gun. So here I am in the northernmost gun shop in the world. <laughs> There's two in town. I went to the northern one. <laughs> Christy was trying on the Russian hat there. Um, you can rent guns. It's a, you can bring your own, too. It's a hassle. Uh, I looked into the rules and it's like... I, I had to mail paperwork a month ahead of time. It's like, I'm not going to do that. I want to I wanted look at the birds. I, it, if we both go, one person has to be on bear duty, not taking photos on guard and the other person's enjoying the birds. We wanted to both bird. So we run the car, it was like, we're not leaving the car, we're just gonna view from in the car, don't leave the car. It said, you'll probably be fine, the bears this time of year aren't in town. Although the month before they had one in town. Um, unfortunately, I didn't see any polar bear on the trip. And that was one of the things, she's seen them in Churchill, I've never seen one. And I really wanted to see one. So that's the favorite polar bear that I saw on the trip, that graffiti. <laughs> Um, and here's a sign on the edge of town. It said, beware of polar bears. 
and then I, I translated that. It says applies to all of Svalbard. So outside of Churchill, Manitoba, which is sort of a, a mecca for polar bears at a certain time, this is probably one of the easiest, one of the easiest and most accessible, ironically, places to see polar bears um, early in the year. May. May is a good time for polar bear. Maybe October, I'm not sure. So, so we drove around. Um, we had the car for one, for one day. <clears throat> we drove by and we saw the Global Seed Vault. Wow. If you've never heard of this, yeah. it's interesting. You, you Google it and read about it. It's a vault built into the side of the mountain that's Locate in an isolated location so that all the worlds, all the countries of the world can take seed samples and send them up here for storage, cold storage, um, that are safe in case of, I don't know, a global pandemic or something. Um, Christy said she read that a country, she thought Syria recently had to take a withdrawal because of the wartime there. They thought they were getting low on a particular, uh, some plant, some agricultural plant. Yeah, that they's like, well, give us some because, I don't know, the wars, the fires, whatever, decimating, we want to plant some of this stuff. North Korea has stuff there. I mean, everybody is welcome. There are no tours. Um, it's actually under construction. They're doing a little bit of construction there. But up here in the front, it, there were some artists who did some sort of glass painting, not a painting, uh, architecture, like three-dimensional <laughs> shards. You're pretty far away. That was a pretty long lens. But anyway... I found it interesting. It, I, it'd be interesting to see a tour, but they don't want people in there. They don't want people in there. That's the thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it would have been nicer to get closer. I don't know. Just to even see, even see the the front. But it, it was interesting. It's it's actually very close to the airport. And here's the airport. So this is like a looking down from the middle. Um, so right along the edge of the water there, just let me say north of the airport is a very good spot for birding. We asked, we read up, we got a book about it, we read up about where's a good spot, and uh, it was. I mean, we just drove, drove the car along, and there's a number of ponds there, an estuary, and uh, some good birding. So, we saw a brant, I think a number of them, common ringed plover, and here, special for Valentine's Day, some mating arctic terns. We saw many arctic terns, they weren't all mating. Barnacle geese. Here's a leucistic one. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not an albino. Leucistic. She told me what that was. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> Snow bunting. Can't see its beak very well. I think it has its mouth open. Another tufted duck. We saw one of those earlier. Some pigeon guillemots. Another Arctic skua, pink-footed goose. Looks kind of similar to the the gray lag, but with pink feet, I guess. Glocka skull, immature. They're kind of hard to identify because there's a couple of similars. A Dunlin, northern fulmar, flying around. That might have been out on a boat tour. That, that photo might have been from the next day. But we saw them nu numerous days. Some sandpipers, might be the same one, a couple of photos. Red-throated loon. Uh, we did see a king eider. It was, I believe, immature. Didn't get a good photo. Uh, it would have been great to see that was, this is a place for them, and they're they're you know they're an Arctic species. Um, they actually had an eider colony where hundreds of common eiders were there, and they actually had a sign eider colony. Um, so along the side of the road. That's how they know how to go there. <laughs> so we pretty much got to the end of the road, and then you'd have to drive down this ravine down the hill cross the stream and then up to get to those other houses like okay well this is we'll stop here <laughs> i don't want to get stuck um here's a guy with out 
with his gun on bear duty as the people were binoculars and birding. We saw this flock of birds. I was like, what are those? They're called little ox. New species for us. It's like, oh, that'd be great if we saw one up close. So up here on the right, that's the mountain we were looking at, and that was what we had to contend with. Just And we saw some movement up in there, and then we saw these little birds going around foraging or whatever. And it's like, oh, it's, they're so hard to see, and that's an extreme crop zoom to see a little off. And that's about as good as it gets for us um, seeing it. It was so far away. But as we were looking around there, we saw some more motion. And can you see up on the top left? Can you see it? <laughs> so zooming in here, see an Arctic fox. And uh, in the summertime, they're not all white. They get this darker color. The ones in Iceland are almost black in the summer. But this one had uh, multiple colorations. I did see one later on, but I didn't get a photo of it in a different spot. So it's all two orchid spots. Up at the end of the road, this is up at a coal mine looking down, once again, it's like midnight, looking down uh, towards, towards the town. This is as far as the road went. We saw some small barred reindeer up in the way. So this is a different species, or at least a different subspecies of reindeer. Um, they're a little bit shorter and stockier. Uh, she looked up some of the differences. I think the coat is a little bit thicker. Um, but it's distinct enough that uh, it, it's a different species. So Svalbard politically is sort of an unusual place. It, it has sort of a unique there's a treaty that they had in the 1920s. It's, it is owned by Norway but anybody can go there. You don't need a visa. Anybody can set up a business there. Anybody can do anything. So there are Russian coal mines set up there. And historically, they've, they've had that. If you want to go start a business there, you can go do it. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to have a visa. So you have actually sort of an international crowd. There were some ethnic restaurants, some Asian, Asian people, Thai. A number of people work in the docks from all... It's kind of like on a go on a cruise ship, you see a lot of international people. So, um, coal mining is one of the industries that they've had, uh, and and a lot of them near Longyearbyen, I think, have been shut down. You see some derelict ones up in the hills. This one was still in operation at the end of the road. So we we go to another town later to to see some of the coal mines. Okay, so the, the next day, our first excursion, full day excursion, we went up to Knee Allison. And we took this boat here, I think it's a 37 footer. Um, long day. Went pretty fast. So, one of the passengers on the boat was this guy named Philip, and he had his dog DJ with him. And we dropped him off half, halfway at this little island called, uh, what was it here? Um, Prince Carl Foreland. It's the name of the island. It's a national park. He's going on a 12-day hike. His backpack weighs 175 pounds. So they took their inflatable boat, drove him over to that island, uninhabited, 12 days alone, he and his dog. He had a gun. He had his provisions. And I said, why are you doing that? It's just, I need to be alone right now, is what he said. So I don't know what that meant. Um... Interesting. I, I'd be afraid to do that, but yeah. 175. 175 pounds. They, they told us I, I had to calculate that. It was it told me in kilograms, but huge. Now maybe he meant that that was all of his gear, but it's almost all there in one pack. I don't know if he had a second one. But. Yeah. So at this same island. They, they did, there's like a meteorological hut here or something. Um, and there was an expedition of people. You need permission to go on the island, but this, all these people in these red coats were at this 
walrus colony. And we got near it. We didn't land, but our boat got near it. Um, not real near, but we got close enough. We saw this colony of walrus. So I have some some um, some facts here. The population in the world for Atlantic walrus is twenty to thirty thousand. The population is forward is about two thousand. The male weigh thirty three hundred pounds and are over eleven feet long. Females weigh two thousand pounds and are eight and a, eight eight a little over eight feet long. Their tusks can be three point three feet long and weigh twelve pounds. Yeah. First time seeing walrus. Um, this guy up here with the pink skin, they say it's uh, when the blood flows close to the skin when they're warm. This guy down here has a, a tusk that's broken off. It's either from fighting or sometimes when they're, sometimes they'll use it for locomotion, hauling themselves out, it can break. Diet is clams, oysters, mollusks, just like, um, barnacles maybe, crab, occasionally birds and seals. This is mostly a bachelor colony. That's the closest I got. From a moving boat, that was a 1200 millimeter, a 600 millimeter lens with a doubler on it. So, <laughs> pitching them. <laughs> I sharpened that up, but that's the closest we got. So, life expectancy is 40 years. The only natural predator is orca and polar bear. So, we went, we went up to the town of Nee Allison. So, the Allison is the northernmost civilian settlement in the world. If you go farther north, you're in the military, pretty much. There's, there's a place in um, Canada called Alert. It's farther north. There's Russian has a settlement on the polar ice that floats around. Military, but yeah. So... If the northernmost thing wasn't in Longyearbyen, it's, it's probably here. <laughs> uh, gorgeous scenery, the, the, the boat captain, I mean, there's only like five people on the boat and we were talking and, and um, he's actually was from Finland, but he's like, the weather's never this good. <laughs> it, it wasn't like glass when we were driving, but I mean, it's probably like six foot seas. I mean, it's like we were ready to get pounded. On the way back, it was a little rougher, but it was pretty smooth sailing. Um, so we made good time up there and you can see some blue skies uh, there's a statue of Roald Amundsen um, Amundsen so he's a polar explorer famous uh, Norwegian polar explorer from that spot they launched an airship I think it was 1926 that went across the North Pole the first time to get to the North Pole he was also the first to get the first Antarctic explorer as well. Some more spots. We, we spent a couple hours in the town. Um, they do have a hotel seasonally. Year-round population is about 35. Uh, summertime population, it balloons to 115. <laughs> um, there was a coal mine in town. It's no longer in operation. And this train goes to the coal mine. That is the world's northernmost train. And... They had a gift shop. Christy mailed a so post. The northernmost gift shop. Northernmost gift yeah, shop. Yeah. And, there. and bagel stand. Yeah. Or was it waffle? Waffle. Waffle stand. And, and liquor store slash, you know, post office slash souvenir store slash. They were well stocked on liquor. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> um, it's mostly for scientific research. The liquor? <laughs> no. The, the, the people who were there, mostly scientific creatures. We, we, we visited the museum in town. You weren't allowed to leave town because of polar bear. Um, but uh, I think I put a photo in there. Maybe I didn't. Uh, NASA has a facility there uh, connected with Wallops Island in, in Maryland for... Um, over the pole Arctic relays when they're launching satellites. Um, there's some radio communications. 
there's four or five different countries. There was a Danish and there was a Chinese place. There was a number of places there. Um, so there's the main drag walk, walking up through town. Down here is a spot that it was interesting, the, the signs talking about the polar bear. When you come into town, this is at the edge of town, you're supposed to stick your gun in there, shoot. Or at least pull the trigger. I mean, you unload it, but pull the trigger so it's make sure it's unloaded because if you if you left one in the chamber, they don't want you walking around town with a gun. So that's for safety. But um, the gun does have to, have to be loaded when you leave the settlement. When you leave the settlement, yeah, there's, there's a guy coming in. So on our way back, we stopped by this glacier for a while, and our our ship's captain and one of the, the guests stripped down to their skivvies and took the polar plunge twice. <laughs> uh, there we go. Christy was tempted. I was really tempted. I, I said, this isn't the place that you want to experience hypothermia. <laughs> we got Epstein Barr on the trip and we were hot. It was rough for a week and a half. Lungs, coughing incessantly. My heart was stuck. Am I going to die? Probably not the best idea. What is it, like 33 degrees in the water? It was hovering around freezing. It might have been actually below. Freezing is like 27, 28. For salt water. Salt water. But I mean, I stuck my hand in. I was probably maybe 35. Is that is your hand calibrated? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't stand probably. Like, like it was cold. Tub, but it would have been cold to do. I didn't bring my drone to Svalbard because we're close to the airport. I didn't think I could fly. It. But one of the other guests got his drone out right from the boat and flew it around. It's like, well, I would have known we could flow from the boat. I would have brought it. But anyway, it's a nice glacier. It was a great tour. It took all day, I don't know, 12 hours or something. The next day, we took a tour that went both to Barentsburg and Pyramiden, two towns that are Russian towns. We didn't see any wildlife in Nialison to speak of. A couple of birds flying in the distance. Um, the boat was going pretty fast. Barentsburg, we really didn't see much wildlife. We, we did in Pyramid. Um, this is a active community. It is Russian. It's on Norwegian land, but it's Russian. It's a Russian community because of this treaty. Um, they they have about 450 people who live there. There's some Russian architecture, the, the, the weird, very blockish uh, Soviet architecture there. Our tour guide was from central Russia, spoke okay English. It's a fascinating place. Um, there's part of the mine up here. I don't know what this other building was. There's a, down in the lower left here is a, an old that brown building. It's a church. Um, we did not have much time because we went to the two down. So we had an hour to walk around maybe. It is a company town. I think population yeah. was right around 300. Most of them Or supporting the mine, yeah. Coal mining. Coal, the coal mines aren't as good as they used to be. They're, they're, at some point this will probably close up. So this was extremely fascinating. We went to this town called Pyramiden, which is, it's actually a ghost town now. At, what, at one time it had about a thousand people at its peak in the 1980s. It is also a Russian town. Okay, so here, it was founded in 1910 by Sweden, but it was sold to the USSR in 1927. The mining operation closed in 1998. The coal deposits were dwindling uh, and difficult to extract costly. There was also a fatal plane crash killed 141 residents coming in. So that's 14% of your population dying on one crash. They just, they just never recovered from that. Uh, it's a ghost town now, it's a living museum um, they do have a hotel. You can stay overnight. 
we were only there for a couple of hours. It would have been fascinating to stay longer. Um, there are six, I read later on, there, there, sometimes in the peak of summer, the, the residents go up to like 10 or 12 or whatever. There's this trust company, Arctic Google Trust, that owns it. Um, so if Nee Allison didn't have the northernmost, Pyramid is technically further north than Longyear Bend, so it has some of the, the things. So that bust of Lenin is the northernmost bust of Lenin. They have a piano in there, they have a bar, a movie theater, they had a film festival and they have a swimming pool. So those are the northernmost things. So people, families lived here. The Russians at, uh, at one point wanted to prove that they could make a community of it and they forced people or coerced them to go up there and work the mines. And but this is still Norway soil? Yeah. It's Norway soil. Okay. Uh, it, it's hard to explain the actual treaty they have up there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been working for a hundred years. Right. And, any, and any one of us could say, hey, if you want to go be a citizen of Hey, I want to go be a, t a tour guide. Have at it. Mm -hmm. It is extremely expensive to live there. There's, there's, it's harsh in the winter. Um, it's not an easy life. Um, so it's not cold enough in Russia, so those people wanted to go there? <laughs> oh, it's colder in Russia than here. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So it's depending on where they're from, this actually might be, that's a, that's a balmy 37 <laughs> degrees, right? I don't know. Um, actually, I, 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 have to, I have to read it again. I think, I think life here for them at the peak probably wasn't that bad compared to a lot of places in Siberia that are, could be a lot worse. So. Their superiority, you know, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, we're fantastic if we give all these things to our people, well, not most of their people. Yeah. So we spent a couple of hours around there. The, the setting is nice. There's a big glacier along the back, and coming in, um, terrible photos, but we got some. We got to see uh, bearded, bearded seal. seal and ringed seal coming in. Um, we saw some other wildlife too we'll talk about later here but uh, just a couple of pictures around town we did see some reindeer I saw an arctic fox in town couldn't get a photo of him he scurried away um, tons and tons of these black leg kitty wakes every single window in these buildings any spot that they could nest they're nesting and I'm sure if the windows are open they're inside too um, not all the buildings, but some of them. So I think maybe some, if they're still occupied, they maybe probably scare them away or whatever. I don't know if Dale mentioned it before on the small bar reindeer. These are a subspecies of the regular that are in Norway. What's different about them? They're a little bit shorter. They have a shorter neck, shorter legs, thicker body. They are not used for animal husbandry, and they are not used as a food source. Okay, I, did, I forgot about that. The most common f uh, cause of death is not polar bear eating them. It's actually starvation from wearing out their teeth. I think polar bear would take most of it. No. Also in town, in this town, we had to be with a guide. Guides. With a loaded gun. Yep. We weren't allowed to wander by ourselves. In the future, I think it would be an awesome place to go back, spend a night or two, you know, rent a gun or rent a guide, and rent a guide. explore yeah. more. Because you can go inside most of these buildings, and you can hike up to the top of the mine. I mean, you, and everything in there is fantastic. They don't care, whatever. <laughs> um, so here's some. There's the mine shaft going. One of the mine shafts heading up the hill there. And they did have a bear in town the previous day. Yeah. Uh, this is inaccessible in the winter. 
because it's further up into a fjord that extends into that island and uh, the glacier just it ice it freezes over uh, it's hiking and snowmobiling to get there in the winter so the summertime um, we weren't even sure that we depending on the way the winds if the, if the wind was pulling ice out of the out of the glacier you know c coming off they might have canceled it but it didn't look too like that. It was fun. So here's a picture down here in the lower left that uh, we think that was an elementary school. Uh, there's a, I'm not sure if that's a bag pie with a little hat there. Babushka. <laughs> Babushka. Yeah. So uh, take a look at this polar bear up here on the top. It, it looks a little funny. And they told us the story that, uh, so the Russian painter who was supposed to paint this sign with the polar bear had never seen one and had never seen a photo of a polar bear. And that's why it looks a little bit like a dog's head on a polar bear. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of interesting. So on our ride home and a little bit on our ride there, we did see some wildlife. We saw some more puffins, North Walmart, but uh, we saw a, um, was it more than one pod of whales? Several pods of belugas. Uh, these are toothed whales, 14 to 15 foot in length, 2,600 to 3,300 pounds, uh, distributed in the Arctic and subarctic waters with a small population in the St. Lawrence River. That's about as far south as they come. And I've seen them up there in Canada. It, uh, not, that far, not that much farther north than uh, Quebec City. If you want to go see it, you, we actually took a whale watching tour out on the St. Lawrence to see belugas. They eat squid, salmon, cod, shrimp. They are predated by polar bear and orca, just like the walrus. So we did see some young. They're kind of they're kind of grayish. That's how you can tell they're not. They don't get that white color until they're adults. We didn't get photos. We did see some minke whale in the distance, and I I didn't really get a good. View, Christy did we saw a blue whale I saw a little bit of a puff she saw a fluke so that was the first blue whale that we've ever seen would have been great to have a photo to just or even just even a better view or the binoculars is at extreme distance probably probably two miles out um, but the captain of the, of the ship coming coming back in uh, what other species humpback we saw humpback um, they said narwhal are extremely rare here. Um, narwhal are like up in the Davis Strait between Greenland and like Ellesmere Island is take one of those nice cruises up the Northwest Passage is a better chance to see narwhal. They're not common here. Um, apparently they say the Atlantic walrus doesn't like the eastern side of Greenland but it does go to Long European or does a uh, uh, small bar a little bit. Um, so full more. And it's pretty much time to come home after a long trip. Svalbard was the, the peak of our trip. We flew back to Tromsø just to, I don't know if we changed plans or we just sat in the tarmac and more people come on and we flew to Oslo. We spent two nights. We went to a, a polar expedition museum. That ship is called the Fram, Fram, and it did numerous um, expeditions into the Arctic Northeast Passage, looking for passage over to Alaska, the Eastern Way. Uh, I think he also took that to the Antarctic. So drove around town a little bit. It's kind of kind of anticlimactic after Svalbard actually <laughs> and because of flights we actually spent one night in Copenhagen uh, we just walked into town we only had about two hours we stayed overnight and then our flight was early in the morning to fly home so we went in town and grabbed some pizza along this uh, little canal here that's very famous so it looks like a really nice place to visit but we had about two hours just took our cell phones and took the subway in to the first stop and checked it out. So. Here's a little summary, you know, Christy Journals, and it's a little hard for you guys to read from back there, but Christy Journals, and on our plane flight home, we were sort of adding up the numbers, and, and I like to do this statistics-wise, and I, I keep track of this kind of stuff, and 
I do for receipts and where we stayed and all, all that kind of stuff. So I spent a year and a half planning this, 200 hours of research, at least 200 hours. Six travel books uh, that I uh, referenced, had bought one new bird guide, five different countries, two oceans, five different seas, spent 21 days, 20 nights, 14 hoes, only hotels, only one of them had air conditioning, Stayed in one apartment because we wanted to have laundry. <laughs> um, I got five, nine of the hotel nights were free using credit card rewards. I've been saving them for years. Seven plane flights, six airports. I flew my drone five times. We rented three different rental cars. Drove in four countries to count Canada. 3,600 miles to count Canada. So we left out of Toronto. Five international border crossings in the car. One parking ticket. There's a whole story with that. It was in Norway. It's an expensive parking ticket. And it's not easy to pay. It's about $100. 258 tunnels I mentioned earlier. We took eight train rides. And if you count like funiculars and subways. Uh, 12 boat rides. Or eight were car ferries and four were passenger boats. 12 days above the Arctic Circle. By far the it was great scenery in the south, but for wildlife, absolutely, the Arctic wildlife was vastly superior. We were looking for it, and fewer trees, so easier to spot, maybe, but the wildlife was better. Different, five different foreign currencies, it wasn't all the Euro. Um, in fact, the only, I think Finland was the only country that used the Euro. Walked 74 miles according to my Fitbit. Nine new mammal species, mountain hare, stoat, which is also called a short-tailed weasel, reindeer, small barred reindeer, Atlantic walrus, blue whale, ring seal, bearded seal, and arctic fox were five new mammal species for me at least. Um, four species of whale, beluga, minke, blue, and humpback. I saw nine foxes, two arctic, and seven red. 54 bird species identified, 18 of which we think we're new one for us, according to how she tracks an e-bird. And I, I, I lost 10 pounds by the time I got home. I normally lose weight on vacation, so I need to go on vacation more often. <laughs> so thank you for listening. I don't know how long that took, but uh, it's a long trip, so thanks for coming along. Do you have any more questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. Mosquitoes. There was a waterfall that was stopped at with a lot of bats. They don't have mosquitoes in Iceland, but they have things called midges. Was it the same here? Alaska is full of mosquitoes. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't recall them being bad. I mean, there was a decent amount of wind, so that that can cut down on that seasonally too. I'm... Were there a lot of fresh water sources, like open lakes that were fresh water? Because they don't breed in salt water. <laughs> Not really. They were more like cattle ponds, so there weren't huge lakes. I mean, well, I'm just wondering further south if there were. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of. Uh, a lot of glacial runoff. I mean, the, the yeah. fjords, yeah. you know, coming down in the valleys, the waterfalls, and it was, it was raining some, although I think we had better than average weather. Maybe it's too cold at night. Well, it's really not much night. Yeah. Well, you would think Alaska, though. I mean, interior Alaska can get cold, although it gets warm, too. But... Yeah, I don't know. But Alaska has swarms. Swarms of mosquitoes. Like, yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you. That was Very fabulous. Good. Fabulous. <laughs> really good. You're welcome. Um, okay, so we can turn the lights on.